Happy Friday and welcome to the Forward Miami show. That's the number four, W-A-R-D, Miami. And for those of you who don't know, we're a local nonprofit and we work on issues of diversity and inclusion. I am your host. My name is Damian Pardo. Our co-host, JC, is missing today. Uh, so he's, he's here with us in spirit. Unfortunately, couldn't be here. And we have a very, very special guest for you today. Rodrigo Heng Leitman is here with us. And Rodrigo is the Deputy Executive Director of the National Center for Transgender Equality. We're thrilled to have him. Welcome, Rodrigo. And me. How are hey, you? Hey, thank you all so much for having me. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Yeah, wonderful. Woo! Wonderful. And it's no surprise that you're working there. I mean, your mom is Ileana ross Landon, that you end up working for rights and, and working in advocacy. That's wonderful. I thought we could start out with you telling us a little bit about your background, kind of like how you got here growing up in Miami, just a little bit about you. Sure. Well, yeah, like you said, I'm born and raised in Miami. And my mom is Ileana ross Leighton, who used to represent Miami for a long time in Congress. She was one of the representatives for about 30 years. Uh, and I happen to be transgender. So when I am a transgender man, so I was born a girl, but, uh, you know, then came out. And when I came out as trans, that ended up making me the first transgender child of a member of Congress, which was Pretty weird twist of fate, <laughs> but there we have it. <laughs> yeah. And then I went on to work in the transgender rights movement for a living. So that's what I do now. I work at NCTE, the National Center for Transgender Quality, as he said. And I live in DC, but I still have a little bit of Miami here with me, right? Noventa Mia is like Cuba, like trying to bring that flavor in. <laughs> that's great. Rodrigo, I thought one of the things we could start talking about uh, at the very beginning is kind of like a lot of people really have no understanding what it's like to be transgender. And uh, growing up in Miami at that time period was also not the easiest thing in the world. Can you kind of explain from a child's perspective growing up and, and even more so in the kind of family you had, which was very well known, very political. How was that for you? Well, you're right that a lot of people still don't really know what it means to be transgender. And I think whenever you're not familiar with a certain community, it's natural to be a little resistant. I think that's just human nature. But the more that people get to know another transgender person, the more they realize that it's not that interesting. And I mean that in a good way, you know, we're just trying to get up in the morning and go to work and put food on the table like anyone else. But I mean, in Miami in particular, um, for me, at least growing up, I didn't know anything about transgender issues. I certainly didn't know the word transgender for a very long time. Um, and I, all I really knew was that I was unhappy. I didn't have the language for it. I didn't have the words, but I absolutely felt like something was off. And I'm really grateful that then when I happened to go to college, I learned about transgender people. And that's when it was like a light bulb went off. Then I, I understood what was going on and then I came out. So, I mean, what really sticks out to me is how important it is to be able to get that information and be able to meet someone like you. Because if I had never met another transgender person, I might not have realized that I was trans, but I would have been unhappy. Like, it's not as though um, I was being introduced to some concept that was totally foreign to me. It was like I was being introduced to myself. And that's now I'm so much happier. I mean, now I'm married and wow. I have a career. And it's just I'm so grateful that I had the chance to go out, but uh, come out. But, you know, the other thing I would say is that for Cuban-Americans, like in my family, there's still kind of this idea sometimes that, LGBTQ issues are like algo por ahí, you know, like something separate and it's not really part of our culture. And that's super untrue. So, you know, my mom and I really like to share the story that like a story of acceptance in Cuban American households in particular. Yeah. I mean, as a gay man, I found that true also in my Cuban American household. And I can relate to what you're saying about the feeling that you're off without having a word because at seven or eight, that's kind of like how I was feeling. But as a transgender person, when you say you were off, can you go a little bit more into that? Like how, how did that express itself in you? 
Well, the best way I can describe it is that it felt like there was some kind of fog in between me and other people. Like I just wasn't connecting in the same way or I would have relationships, but it wouldn't quite wouldn't quite land, you know, and it wasn't um, it wasn't that anyone was wrong. You know, everyone was. um, But it just I don't know. I felt I felt a disconnect. I felt a disconnect or like there was some kind of wall between me and other people. I just didn't understand why. Um, and then when I met other trans people, then it, did, it It was just all of a sudden, I was like, that's it, that's it. And it's so funny because I, you know, wasn't, um, I wasn't like particularly, um, like I think sometimes there's an idea that if you're a transgender man, that then when you were a girl, you must have been a lesbian and you must have like been obviously very masculine. Um, and that was like kind of true for me, but not a hundred percent. Um, and I think it was meeting other trans men who were gay that I was like, oh, there we go. That's possible. <laughs> Cause you know, I am a gay man. Like I'm married, I have a husband, When I say I'm married, I'm married to another man. Um, and so it was important <laughs> to be able to like kind of unlock that part of the representation that, oh, being trans means you can be any sexual orientation, just like non-trans people are any sexual orientation. <laughs> That is, you're absolutely right. That's so difficult for people to understand because gender identity is different than sexual orientation. Oh, and did I lose you? It seems frozen here on my end. Sorry. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly on my end. Tommy, is there? I think it's on your side. Can you hear me, Rodrigo? Yeah, I guess it is. Let's just give it a few minutes. And Rodrigo, can you hear me? Oh, sorry. It cut. Can you all hear me now? Yes. Okay. Can you hear so us? Sorry about that. I don't know what's going no. on here, but yeah, I heard you say about sexual orientation and gender identity. Yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of people um, we're not we're not raised to learn about all of this diversity of experiences that are really out there. So we're, we're raised in these boxes of that there's there's just boys and girls and, you know, they're born boys and girls and raised boys and girls and that's it. And they they marry the different gender. Um, right. And, you know, for a lot of us, that really is the case and that's fine. But for those of us for whom that's not the case, well, if we're not taught about that diversity of experience, then we don't really, we think there's something wrong with us. We think that it must be some kind of mistake. So it's right. so important for parents to be able to model that kind of acceptance um, for their kids and be able to actually say in voz alta, like say like proactively that there are gay people and there are bi people and there are trans people and all of that is part of our culture and that's okay. I mean, you, you never know who your kids are gonna turn out to be. You may right. not think you have a transgender child right now, but you'd be surprised. My mom did not know she had a trans son until she did, you know? Right. Um, so if you model that kind of acceptance early on, it just, it makes such a difference for, for your kids. Yeah. I think it's helpful for people to understand that it's not binary. Like very few things in life are binary. And even though the majority of people fall into two general categories, for those people that don't, it's really important to be sensitive to that because they're near you, they're friends of yours, they're your family members, or even your own children. So it's important to to kind of have that open-mindedness about the issue in general, which is why it's also important to get to know people that are transgender and ask kind of all those questions that you might be, you know, afraid of asking, because that's the only, the only way you really get to know it, a lot of uh, institutions, religious and otherwise, still make it a binary kind of thing. And I think that puts a lot of pressure on the transgender community. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. And it's it's so important for people to learn more about these kinds of experiences, like you're saying, because there's, even when you think you know, then there's so much more underneath it. Um, and especially kind of understanding that transgender people are part of every culture and in history. There's still a stereotype that being transgender is something modern. It's something new. But transgender people have always existed. It was just a matter of whether or not we could be out and what kinds of terms we used. I mean, so for a long time, transgender people hid in the shadows. 
But if you go really far back in history in some places, you find that people, trans people lived openly. And like in lots of parts of Latin America before colonization, there were a lot of tribes and different indigenous groups that recognized more than two genders. Now yeah. that's going really far back in time, but I think it just shows that we've always been here. Right. <laughs> it's just right. um, that what might seem like a very new political thing is just a human thing. We're just people right. and we're only getting involved in politics because our rights are under attack. But, um, but most of us would just like to, you know, live, peaceful lives <laughs> without right. having to delve into that stuff. Well, speaking of that, I know that Florida just passed a law that was very damaging to transgender youth particularly. And I thought maybe you could go into that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. The Florida House of Representatives passed a ban on transgender youth playing sports. I mean, and it, it's so heartless because it is about, it is specifically targeting young people. I mean, these are people who, are, these are kids who are in schools and they're just trying to play a sport for the same reasons as any other kid. They want to hang out with their friends. They want to, to get or stay in shape. They, and they don't, they don't want to be excluded from a basic school activity just because of who they are. I mean, I think all of us have had some kind of experience in our lives where we felt left out. And it's heartbreaking to put yourself in these trans youth shoes and think about what if what if you were in middle school or high school and you were being left out of the team by your own government, by the adults who are supposed to be taking care of you. I mean, all of us as adults, we're at our best when we are helping young people to grow and to learn, not putting a target on their back. So this is a really gut-wrenching attack on transgender youth. Um, but you know, it's only through, it's only passed in the house of representatives. It has no, it's still in the Senate. So every, everyone watching at home, I mean, I'd urge you to, uh, write to your senators, uh, write to your Florida state senators and tell them to vote no on the student athlete ban on the trans student athlete ban. Because if we speak up enough, if we put enough pressure on them, they'll, they can stop this, but it's on us to let them know that we won't stand for it. And Rodrigo, I think a lot of it, a lot of the imagery around this debate is kind of like the whole bathroom debate with transgender people where, you know, typically they they show, you know, like a, a very big woman trying to compete with like, you know, smaller girls in a women's sport and how unfair that is for the girls. And for people who don't know any further than that, what can you help for them to understand the complexity of the issue? Well, you know, there's really what's happening here is that the people who are ideologically anti-transgender are trying to take advantage of the fact that most of us don't know a transgender person. I right. mean, most Americans and most people in Miami don't think that they've ever met someone who's trans. Now, they might have, and they just didn't realize it. I think a lot of people have met me and didn't know that I was transgender. Right. So, you know, just because you don't think you've met someone trans doesn't mean you haven't. But um, if even if you think you haven't met somebody trans, well, then we're kind of a, a blank space in your mind, chances are. Chances are you don't know a lot about transgender people. So it's easy to believe misinformation put out about trans people. But, you know, people who are trans, like, especially transgender youth are just trying to, to go to school and learn and be with their friends. Um, this, uh, you know, it might be surprising to learn that a lot of school districts have already had trans student athletes on their teams and they've created their own rules and they've created protocol for how to handle that um, in ways that are really relevant for people who are that young. Um, you know, the Olympics and the NCAA also have rules about transgender athletes. So they also have done really good work on handling how to integrate trans athletes. And those rules are different because those people are adults. When right. you're talking about young people, you know, we don't want any young person to ever feel pressured to doing something that they're not ready for. So the rules are more flexible for someone who's young because they're still figuring themselves out and that's okay. Um, but you know, it's just- And when you, use the word, when you use the word heartless, 
that's why it's heartless. I mean, yeah. you're very vulnerable at that age. And to think that with that vulnerability, you're just trying to kind of like, you know, uh, bloom in some ways. And that gets stunted by this thing, which is really devastating if you're that vulnerable because you're just still trying to figure yourself out in the most vulnerable way, really, at least the way yeah. I see it. Exactly. You're still figuring out who you are and you are most likely pretty scared to share that with the world. Um, I think it's, you know, it's easy to forget that being young is pretty hard. Sometimes it can be really scary. You can feel vulnerable and um, you might be really scared in particular of losing your family because a lot of transgender people, unfortunately, we are rejected by our families a lot. I wasn't and thank God, but you know, I do this work every day because I want, every other trans person to feel the kind of acceptance that I've gotten to have from my family. Not everybody has that. So when we're thinking about trans youth, they're probably still living at home with their families. And if their families kick them out, they probably don't have anywhere else to go. So these student at trans student athlete bands, they raise the stakes. They send the message to young people that who you are is not okay. And they make it feel even more scary to come out and they make it even more dangerous because they actually put policy in place that will actively inflict harm on you if you disclose the fact that you're trans. Um, but again, about the sports, you know, I think it's reassuring that a lot of school districts already had trans student athletes on their teams and they figured it out. Um, it's not really the government's place to come swooping in and putting on these draconian bands, these really broad, um, just blanket bands on trans youth being involved at all. Um, I, I really think that's what echo, makes it really tough. I really wanted to echo something you said about the homeless part. Because trans people are not understood very well and they're not adequately represented in policy, it's very hard for trans homeless youth to find any support or place or shelter that they can even stay in. So it really is that much more devastating, I think, to that to that specific part of the community. That's completely correct. I mean, when you know, you can stop and think about what if you faced a crisis? What if you lost your home and you had to go to a shelter? Well, there aren't enough places for you to go. There aren't enough options or resources out there to begin with. And then you think about what if you were trans? I mean, there are the, the prior presidential administration even tried to make a rule to allow homeless shelters to turn people away if they happen to be trans. Wow. Or, yeah, it's shocking. And, and the rule actually would have even made it okay to turn someone away if you suspected that they were trans. Even that would be enough to reject someone and put them on the street. Now, thankfully, we fought against that at NCTE and a lot of, of our colleague organizations, coalition partners, we fought against that. And so we were able to defeat it. So now transgender people still have protections. Um, a homeless shelter cannot kick you out just because you happen to be trans. But you can imagine that just the fact that we had to fight that hard for that really basic thing shows how much discrimination is still out there. I mean, we do this survey about trans people's experiences. It's called the US Transgender Survey, creatively enough. <laughs> and I mean, we found that it's somewhere in the ballpark of one out of every four trans people has been homeless at some point in their lives. Um, so it just really shows how high the stakes I are. I know in Miami-Dade County, it is very difficult to place trans youth in any kind of homeless shelter. It's just very, very, very difficult. And most don't end up there. So it is, yeah. it is a really difficult situation. Yeah, we need more services for people experiencing homelessness anyway, for any type of person. And we especially need services that are respectful of people being trans. Because if you're homeless and you're trans, you have some unique needs. Um, there might You might face additional barriers in getting quality health care. Um, you know, there's trans people who take hormones and then they face homelessness. They they lose their job and they don't have money and they can't stay on their hormones anymore. Unemployment is big, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, employment discrimination is rampant where, um, you know, one, one other thing that might um, 
that a lot of people don't realize is that it's really hard to update your IDs if you're trans. So like, you know, your driver's license, your birth certificate, things like that. It's hard to update that to say your new name and to say your authentic gender. But, and then imagine if you were applying for a job, you have to show those IDs. And so a lot of trans people who are qualified and smart and hardworking get turned away when we show our ID or when an employer runs a background check, a prospective employer makes an offer to you and you think, oh, this is great, I finally got the job. And then they run the background check and they find out that you used to go by another name and that you're trans and they take the job away. I mean, it is so hard to get out of that cycle of poverty, um, I think for anyone, but especially when you're trans and for some unique reasons when you happen to be trans. There's one thing I also always calls my attention, and that's, uh, number one, the sensitivity that a lot of people don't have because they don't understand about calling someone who's trans by the correct gender. You know, oftentimes, sometimes it's intentional and it's done simply to to create, uh, a, you know, a difficult situation for the person. But sometimes it's really not intentional. And I think it's so important for people to understand calling the right gender, what that means for a transgender person. Maybe you could shed a little bit of light on that. Sure, it's really a sign of respect. Um, what, you know, when you think about what if you got married and you changed your last name uh, and then your family kept calling you by that, that name from before you got married. You might feel like, do you not respect my marriage? Do you not think that my marriage is valid? That's what it's like for someone who's trans with our first names. Um, you know, like my name's Rodrigo. It's it's the only name everybody, anybody knows me by now. If you were to call me by that name I was given at birth, it, it just wouldn't fit. It would feel absurd, right? And, and it would feel hurtful. It would feel like um, not respecting who I am today. Now, like you said, a lot of times it's just an accident. You know, it is totally normal for to make a few mistakes before you get it right. I mean, habits run deep, right? So it takes time to break a habit. That's fine. Um, if you, if someone comes out to you as trans and they say, hey, I have this, just apologize and move on. I mean, the apology might seem like a small thing, but that's what lets the trans person know that it was just an accident. That's how they know that it was just an innocent yeah. mistake as opposed to you um, be malicious. And so if you just apologize, even if it's just one sentence, it lets us know that it really was just an accident. And then we can kind of lower our blood pressure and, <laughs> and relax and be able to move on. <laughs> Thank you for saying that too, because a lot of times people feel it's so awkward that they don't apologize. You know, they just don't know how to react. So that's that's great to know, absolutely. Something yeah. else I wanted to touch on also, just because it's been making the rounds through social media, is the elite athlete competitive level issues with like the, you know, I've, I've heard and seen a lot of different things about after puberty, if you start transitioning, uh, you know, that woman still has male muscle mass in the thighs and other areas. You know, it becomes this whole medical debate that seems really technical and difficult. And I was wondering what your thoughts were around that. Yeah, I mean, you know, like with any new topic, it can seem at first like, oh, how in the world would we make this work? Um, and I think what we all have in common is that we, we all value fairness. We all want this to be as fair as possible for everyone. And the good news is that there are people who study elite sports whose focus is all about that. And they've been investigating this for years because again, trans people aren't new. <laughs> we were here a long time before politicians made a target out of us. So, you know, these experts who really study sports and doctors who study trans healthcare have already looked into this and they've universally said that there's no advantage in being trans, whether a trans man or a trans woman. Um, in competitive gendered sports. If there was, you would see trans athletes winning gold medals all the time. <laughs> you know, trans people have been allowed to compete in the Olympics for years and years, and we've never won. I mean, Caitlyn Jenner, before she came out, right? Like before any <laughs> medical trans stuff. Um, trans people have been allowed to compete for a while, and we haven't won any gold medals because guess what? It's really hard to win a gold medal, and it goes to the person who 
really is uniquely qualified, gender doesn't have anything to do with it. So, you know, people who really study this stuff, like the NCAA, um, the National Women's Law Center, I mean, people who look at women's rights from every angle. Like the Olympics, I think that recently has been uh, on the rounds of social media because of the Olympics. Yeah, yeah, that's right, because the Olympics are so in the spotlight. Um, But, you know, trans athletes, you hear every once in a while a news story about a transgender girl winning a race, but you don't hear a lot of news stories about a non-transgender girl winning the race. or You don't hear a lot of news stories about trans kids losing their races. And that actually is the most common. I mean, yeah, every once in a while a trans athlete wins because there are some really talented people out there, whether trans or not. But the norm is that trans people are, you know, not any more athletic <laughs> than anyone else. I mean... I can testify. And so, <laughs> you know, gender, when you really run the numbers and you really see who's winning and losing, gender doesn't have anything to do with it. And, and I think that's really reassuring. It means that, you know, you can have trans athletes on teams of any gender and, and it's still fair and competitive for everybody involved. And do you think it's a fair debate to have, like at the Olympic level, at the elite level? I think it's a debate that we're eventually going to outgrow. You know, I think um, whenever a group of people have been marginalized and then we start and then they start making advances, things like this get debated. I mean, um, for example, when um, there was a big debate around uh, teams being desegregated, uh, like, whoa, is it really going to be okay to have white and black athletes on the same team? That seems ridiculous to us now. Now we're like, of course, that's fine. But it was a real matter of public debate then. And it's obvious to us today. I think this is going to be like that. I think, you know, these things come up and the first time when it feels new, it's debated in the public space. And then a generation later, we're like, oh, that that was silly. Why did we get so worked up over that? So I think it's part of like what it is for a community to get in the spotlight and make advances like this. And eventually we'll all see, you know, enough trans youth will be out and be um, showing who we really are, that then a lot of non-trans people are going to realize that this is no big deal. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you there. What about on the frontier? What are maybe some issues that you're seeing bubbling up? Like, I would never have thought sports would have been so, you know, at the forefront. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, me neither. You know, I don't really follow sports, so I joke that the only time I learn about sports is when an athlete comes out as gay or trans. <laughs> now I'm learning a lot about sports. <laughs> but, um, you know, the other thing that's coming up a lot is health care. Um, just as a lot of states are seeking to ban trans uh, students from playing on sports, a lot of states are also trying to ban trans youth from accessing health care, which is just so painful. I mean... Uh, you I mean think like blockers can... or anything that, that helps with transitioning? Yeah, anything that helps with transitioning. At times, even therapy. Like as in just talking to a counselor, just having questions and, and trying to figure yourself out and you just want to confide in someone, a mental health professional, we should all be able to access therapy when we're having a hard time, no matter but Do you mean like are. in the schools or, or in general? All of it. All of really? it. In schools in private practice, private insurance. Um, I'm shocked, Medicare. actually. I never would have thought that. Yeah, it's shocking. I mean, you would think that at the in a pandemic, especially, we would not try to make it harder to get health care. I mean, I think the pandemic should have really shown us that we need to make health care easy and accessible and cheap to get so that everyone can get what they need. Um, and here we have elected officials trying to use trans youth to score points for themselves and trying to block young people from being able to access any kind of transition related health care, even mental health care. So we really wow. need to fight back against that. Definitely. Rodrigo, we're almost out of time, but I want to make sure people know where they can go to get more resources on this issue and to get in touch with you or your organization. Absolutely. Well, go to transequality.org. Uh, that is the website for where I work, National Center for Transgender Equality. We have tons of resources on there. If you have any questions about legislation, but also just about trans people in general, it's a really good resource. So again, that's transequality.org. Um, and you can look us up on Facebook and Twitter and all that at Transequality Now.
That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. I look forward to treating you to a cafecito cubano in Miami on your next trip home, okay? Big I hug. would love that. Big yeah, hug. thank you so much for having me. This was great. We should do it no. again. Thank you. And thanks to everyone out there for joining us.